What's up, world? This is your brother in the Lord Zion, representing Hog Mom Ministries right here in Savannah, Georgia. And my purpose for coming to you today is to dive into God's Word and give you a spiritual thought for today. Uh, and prayerfully, by the grace of God, the Word of God that is shared will inspire you to live more fervently and committed uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that being said, we're going to pray and dive right into it. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, God, we thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for the great privilege that we have to hold your word in our hands. Uh, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is not just the author of this divine book, but he is also uh, the paraclete that you have given us to make his residence in, on the inside of us, God, who ultimately leads us into all truth. He is the author of this book, and he is also the teacher. And so, God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would open our minds, allow your word, Lord God, to again be planted deep into our hearts, but ultimately, uh, we pray that in your, your sovereign will in time, that you will cause it to grow. Uh, again, for believers, that we will grow in maturity and grace, that we may live more committed to your will. And at the same time, go, God, in the life of sinners, as this word is planted, that you will cause it to grow, that sinners may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that being said, we're going to go at, uh, and look at Romans chapter number five. Uh, verse number 12 will be our our launch pad uh, for this particular teaching. And this teaching today will come to you in the form of a question. Why Jesus? And I want that to just sink in for a minute. Why Jesus? Now, the first thing that I'll say is that as a young man, I, rec I can recall, recall growing up, uh, constantly hearing people say, uh, young man, you need to get saved. You need to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you need to be born again. I used to hear all of these uh, things uh, of sorts. Uh, but I can never recall anybody taking the time uh, to explain to me why Jesus. Why not Buddha? Why not Allah? Why not Krishna? Or better yet, why do I have to believe in anybody? I believe because shouldn't me just being a good person and trying to do my best and live my best life uh, and at the end of my life, you know, that should count for something. Why, why do I have to believe in anything? And that's what I want to address today. And here in the book of Romans chapter number five, the apostle Paul writes, and he says in verse number 12, he says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all have sin. Now, the first thing that I want to say is that here the Apostle Paul uh, makes a declaration that this physical world in which we live, this world right here, uh, there existed a time in history where sin, misery, pain, calamity, death, and all of the relating uh, uh, realities, there was a time in this particular world where those things did not exist. However, he says, because of one man's transgression, because of one man's sin, he says that changed forever. He says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. But then he goes on to say that when sin entered into, into the world, sin brought a companion. And he says, death entered in with it. And he says, now, consequently, because sin has entered into the world, now death has been passed unto all men. Why? Because all have sin. Well, for the careful reader, and if you consider what Paul is saying here, perhaps the question arises, well, when and how uh, did this happen? And if you have been around the things of God or have spent any time in the Bible, uh, perhaps you've heard the story about Adam and Eve. God creates his first man and his first woman, and he places them in a garden. And particularly, he places them in the garden and he gives them one command. He gives them one prohibition. He says that out of all the trees that are in the garden, in Genesis chapter number two, he tells Adam uh, that you may freely partake of, eat as much and feast as freely as you ought. He says, but the tree that is in the midst of the garden, identified as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says to stay away from it. He not only gives them that command, but he tells them what will be the consequence if he chose to disobey God's command. He says, for the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. Well, that's in Genesis chapter number two, verses 16 and 17. 
By the time we get to Genesis chapter number three, verses one through seven, you know that the scripture goes on to tell us that Satan shows up in the garden doing his deceptive and diabolical bidding. He approaches Eve uh, and he plants that question of doubt or that seed of doubt by saying, have God really said thou should not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? <laughs> As a sidebar, when you consider uh, the natural flow of the Bible, when God creates Adam and he places him in the garden and he gives Adam that command, Eve was not yet even created. However, she knew that God said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the scripture would cause us to pre presuppose that she got that knowledge from her husband. We never see in the Bible where God comes back directly to Eve and tell Eve like he directly told Adam, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So with that being said, Satan comes to her and he asks that question in the form of doubt. Has God really said? Something to think about. However, when you get to Genesis chapter number three, verses six and seven, the Bible says that when she saw the tree, one desiring to make one wise, she took of it, ate of it, and she also gave to her husband who was with her, and he took and ate of the tree. The Bible says nothing happened when she ate, but when he ate, the Bible says at that very moment, their eyes both were open and they knew that they were naked. And what is theologically referred to or known as the fall of man at that very moment happened. They died just as God promised that they would die. Well, spiritual death cannot be illustrated for us or seen by the natural eye. So God demonstrated it for us by physical death following. I think the Bible tells us that some 973 years later, Adam physically died. But the Bible is true at that very moment when he partook, he died at that very moment. Separation occurred between him and his creator. When you think about death, death is always, according to the scripture, uh, referring to separation. Death is never annihilation. Death is never the end as the Bible defines death. For example, when you think about physical death, we've all been to funerals. When you go to a funeral, uh, that casket is there at the front of the church, right? Uh, that body, that corpse is lying there. Where is the life that once housed that body? It has been swept into eternity in one or two places, either in heaven or in hell. But death right there, we see the reality is that body and spirit have been separated. Well, that is true in the physical sense, but also in the spiritual sense. God created man for himself. Man was created for God. He was created to know God. He was created to worship God and commune with God. When you read over there in Genesis, the Bible says God would come in the cool of the day to walk with Adam and to commune with Adam, right? But when Adam in high treason, in spiritual high treason, rebelled against his creator by disobeying God's one command that he gave to him, death occurs, separation occurred, where now man and God have been eternally separated. And because we have been separated from our creator, again, physical death now follows as an outward demonstration of our spiritual condition or our inner condition, which is we are spiritually dead. That's why men ultimately physically die. Remember what the promise was for disobedience. For the day that thou eatest of the tree, thou shalt surely die. Death was not a natural occurrence. Man would have lived eternally because he would have been in an eternal relationship with God. But because Adam's sin now causing a separation between him and his creator, he's dead at that very moment spiritually and then physical death later ensues. And the reality is because that is true of Adam and Eve, who are our foreparents, that same sin seed and that same condemnation for sin has been passed to his entire posterity, meaning his entire generation. So generation after generation, that same reality is true of us all. No one had to teach me to sin. I did it by nature. I have three children. I've never had to teach any of them to lie. I've had to teach them to tell the truth. You know why? Because the Bible is absolutely true that according to Psalms 36 that the wicked are estranged from the womb and as soon as they are born they manifest their estrangement 
by speaking lies. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that is true of all of humanity. In Romans, excuse me, in Isaiah chapter 6, before verse 6, he says, and I'll read it for you. Isaiah chapter number 64, verse 6 says it this way. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are, are as filthy rags. He says, we all do fade as a leaf, and our infirmities, like the wind, have taken us away. We are all as an unclean thing, unprofitable. And that idea there is the, uh, the time of the month when a woman go through, goes through her menstrual cycle. If that which is discharged from her body is to be caught on a rag, we would not dare touch that with our ne naked hand. We would see that as being filthy, not fit for any good use, but to be discarded. Well, this is what Isaiah says, that as a result of us all being made sinners, the best of our deeds are as filthy rags. If the best that you and I can muster in and of ourselves before a holy and righteous God is as filthy rags, then we know what the rest of our, our deeds are. And so he says, again, recapping, that as a result of one man, sin has entered into the world. Now death and sin has been passed unto all men because all have sinned. Romans 3, 23. Because of that, the best of our deeds are as filthy rags. There is nothing that we can do, humanly speaking, in and of ourselves to please God, to be made right with God, to gain God's favor. favor. This is man's condition. This is the condition of humanity. This is the condition of every boy, girl, boy and girl born into the human race. We are born in a sinful, condemned condition. But in light of that, picture God in a dilemma. Now, God has never been in a dilemma, but just for the sake of this teaching, picture that. On one side, God being the sovereign potentate, the sovereign creator, who not only is the sovereign ruler of all things, but who also has the right to be obeyed. He has instituted a perfect and righteous standard. He has declared, thou shall not, but man in his rebellion has said, I shall, and I'll do what I want, when I want, as much as I want. Do you realize that if God would have simply allowed Adam and Eve to live the rest of their lives in existence in that state, as well as their entire posterity, to the point where they died, and as a result of their condition, come before him and perish eternally in a burning hell, God would have been perfectly righteous and just in doing so. But picture God in this dilemma, again, perverterly speaking. On one side, you have God's perfect holiness, his perfect righteousness, the one that institutes a perfect standard and law that is to be obeyed. But man has failed in obeying that law. But at the same time, he is a perfect and righteous God who is also equally a loving and a merciful God. And so therefore, he could have rightfully so allowed us to perish in our sinful condition, but did not want to do that because he's a merciful God. Well, the question is, how does God solve this, again, proverbially speaking, this dilemma? On one side, he's perfectly holy. On this other side, he's equally, equally and perfectly righteous and merciful and graceful. Yet his creation has went wayward and rightfully deserve eternal judgment. But that is not what he desires for his creation. How does God solve this dilemma? He solves it in the person and the work of his eternal son. You have man's condition being one of condemnation. And the answer to man's condition, we might say, is man's redemption. Now, the first thing I want to say before we look at Galatians chapter number three, verse 13, which would be the next scripture uh, that we go to, is that it is important to realize Jesus Christ was not an ambulance sent to a terrible wreck. And you say, Brother Zion, what, what do you mean by that? In other words, Jesus Christ was not an afterthought. This was not God the Father saying, oh my gosh, again, 
<laughs> proverbially speaking. My creation has disobeyed me. He has failed from grace. He has disobeyed my holy standard and righteous law. How can I now react to his falling or his disobedience to fix this situation? That is not the case. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ was as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, this is a very uh, interesting perspective because the Bible is saying because God is all knowing in the mind of God, Jesus Christ had already gone before us in the mind of God and had already paid the penalty for God's elect, died on the cross in the mind of God and already raised for their justification. And so there's a sense in which, again, God not just is the God of the present, but he's also the God of the future. Not because he sees down the corridors of time and sees what's going to happen and therefore reacts. No, he's the God of the future as well. Even the future is from our God. And so in Galatians chapter number three, verse 13, Paul writing to the church at Galatia says it this way. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, the word redemption is defined this way. It means to buy back or to purchase or to deliver by way of a payment or a ransom. And so we started out by, again, delineating man's condition. But man's condition is met by God's redemption. And the way that God righteously redeems us is by making a payment for us in order that we might be bought back or purchased back unto himself that he might be and remain, as Paul says in Romans, the just and the justifier of those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. In Acts chapter number 20, verse 28, if you uh, read over there, uh, is there where the scripture exalts the believers at Ephesus to contend for the faith and guard the flock of God, who he goes on to say, who hath been purchased by his own blood. That same word purchased there is the same Greek word that is defined here in Galatians as redeemed. Salvation is not free. It is offered freely. We hear it all the time. We see it on bumper stickers. We see it on t-shirts. Salvation is free. Salvation is free. But does the Bible really teach that salvation is free? I would argue that it doesn't. It costs God the Father a premium price in order to save fallen sinners. It cost him his only unique son. Salvation is not free. It costs the son a premium price, namely leaving glory, coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, living amongst peasants, <laughs> amongst sinners, for 30 and three years, subjecting himself to the ridicule and the blaspheme of his creation, being spat upon, beaten, nailed to a cross between two thieves, for what? To fulfill all righteousness, bring glory to God the Father, but ultimately that he might redeem fallen sinners. So salvation is not free, it costs. And guess what, I'll even take it a step further. If you or I ever going to receive this salvation, it's going to cost you and I everything. That is the gospel. We hear a lot of things in our culture. We hear a lot of things that sound good. But the salvation that the Bible teaches costs God, it costs the Son. And if you or I are going to receive it, it's going to cost us everything. It's going to cost us friendships. It's going to cost us potentially business opportunities. It's going to cost us family. Jesus says, there is no one having lost mother, father, sister, brother, yea, even his own life that haven't or will receive in this life a hundredfold and then eternal life in the afterlife. Just something to think about. Salvation is not free. And so getting back to Galatians 3.13, this idea of redemption, it speaks to the idea that God paid an ultimate price to see you and I redeemed unto Christ. Colossians chapter number one, verse 13. I'll give you a chance to flip over there. Colossians chapter number one, verse 13 and 14. says it this way. Speaking of Christ, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom 
of his dear son. Watch this in verse 14. In whom we have, there's that word again, redemption. And I'm reading from the King James. Uh, other versions may read slightly different. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. Notice he says redemption is in Christ and that uh, forgiveness that as a result of his blood, which comes to us, it comes to us through faith in Christ Jesus. Man's condition, one of condemnation, is met by man's redemption, which comes to us through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In my closing, I'll give you a few proof texts um, regarding this very question. Why Jesus? Because in John chapter number 3, verse 16 through 18, very familiar passage, it says, For God so loved this world that he gave us his only begotten son or his only one and unique son. The word begotten, that doesn't mean born. It actually means only unique son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Often we stop there. But verse 17 says, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn this world. Why? Because the world is already condemned, as we've already stated. He says, But that the world through him might believe. He says in verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You say, why Jesus? Because Isaiah 43 and 11 says, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. All other ways, all other saviors supposedly are frauds. They're idols, they're dead gods, dead demigods that cannot and will not save. You say, why Jesus? Because in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He said all other ways or supposed ways or people who claim that they are the way, he says they're not. Which would also include man's own self-righteousness. But I'm a good person. No, there is none good. He said, why Jesus? Because in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, you can flip over there with me. 1 John chapter number 5, verse 11 and 12. It is here that the scripture says, and this is the record, that God hath given us eternal life. However, this life is in his Son. He that believeth in the Son hath life. And he that believeth not on the Son of God, he says, does not have life. Why Jesus? Because he has the only, or has been the only, excuse me, propitiation for man's sin. He is what the Father has put forth as an answer to man's condition. Because he is the one who is our redemption. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray in these few scattered words, God, that you would get glory for yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Marvin.